I'm Jim Hutchinson with the Fisherman Magazine aboard my 204 Angler Pro. The boat itself was built in 2000. The engine, old Merc 150, I don't know, she's 16, 17 years old. I bought the boat used and I love it, absolutely love it. Don't know how many hours are on that Merc, like I said, so I'm sure at some point that's going to have to be an upgrade. But I look at this boat and say it's perfect for me in the back bay, fishing for fluke and weak fish and striped bass. So instead of upgrading completely and getting a brand new fishing machine, I'm always looking for a way to make this a little bit better. There's the addition of electronics, added the rocket launcher, but now for the way I fish, I really wanted to look at putting a Minn Kota trolling motor on the bow to really help me in the back bay, to hold spot, the spot lock, and also for uh, getting myself through wind against tide conditions for fluke fishing. It's a great layout for a little center console. Got some, uh, some hatches forward right now where the anchor is, couple of hatches plus the space underneath the helm station and um, the uh, live well in the back. Plenty of space. It's a fun boat to fish, but instead of the complete upgrade, I wanted to figure this out. How can I put the Minn Kota trolling motor into this center console to make it work? So after the Minn Kota purchase, I needed to find somebody to really help me. So I turned to my friend Aaron Held at Octopus Yachts, who's going to take us through the process. Yo, Aaron. Hey, Jim. Good morning. What's going on? How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm excited. We're looking forward to uh, getting the trolling motor installed. So Absolutely. This let's, looks like all the stuff right here. Yeah, let's go through the pieces that we have. The remote circuit breaker, quick release bracket, very important battery charger. Let's take a look at all this stuff. Let me know what it is. First item on the table is a great accessory that really increases the versatility of the motor, and that's the micro remote. It allows you to steer uh, left and right, it allows you to increase speed, uh, decrease speed, engage the spot lock, turn the autopilot on and off, and walk around the boat all doing so. So, while not mandatory, really increases the functionality of your trolling motor because you're not tied to the foot pedal control on the trolling motor. So nice accessory, good part of the package. Next item on the table is our circuit breaker, and this is a mandatory part of the install. Uh, if we're gonna do the installation according to the owner's manual, the installation guide, and importantly, ABYC requirements, we need overcurrent protection for this high draw device. So this is a 60 amp circuit breaker. Uh, it's gonna work out great for our trolling motor that we're gonna wire in on 36 volts. So we'll mount this in a nice accessible location. Not mandatory, but also a great idea to make a real complete installation is the quick release bracket. I want a nice secure mount for the trolling motor. And this allows us to bolt this plate down to the boat and get that nice and secure. That can often be one of the most challenging steps of a trolling motor installation. And then quickly remove the motor if we decide we don't need the motor for that day's activities, uh, if we're not fishing, or if we're using the boat uh, for say a far offshore trip, or trailering, or even for winter storage, bring the motor inside the garage. Next, we have our battery charger. And this is uh, one way to get the electricity that the electric trolling motor will use throughout the day back into the batteries for the next day. It's probably the most cost effective. And I like a built-in battery charger because it's a lot safer than a portable battery charger and it's a lot more convenient. All the wiring is done during install. We can do it to ABYC specifications. And then when it comes time to charge your batteries, we're just plugging in a shore power cord, either a normal extension cord from say a garage or an outside outlet or a full marine 30 amp shore power cord. Last but not least, we have our Minn Kota Riptide trolling motor right here. And Jim, what do you say that we take this down, put it on the floor, open the box, and go through all the pieces and components that are inside? Slid right out of the box. Let's make sure we got everything. First up here, our instruction packet, uh, some mounting hardware, and then we've got a nice 72 inch long shaft, uh, main controller for the uh, iPilot, 
in this. Got the head of the trolling motor, uh, our propeller, nice heavy duty weedless wedge too. We have more uh, bubble wrapped. Let's see what we got in here. It looks like it's the heading sensor for the autopilot. So that's going to give our autopilot uh, direction. It's an electronic compass. So we're gonna pay special attention to mounting that on the boat and then connecting that back to uh, power. And then here is our motor as well as our deck mount. So got our 36 volt motor, wrap it up nice. Let's take it out of the bag here. Got some heft to it. Take it off the styrofoam and we'll take it out of the plastic. We have our networking connector, we have our power connector, and then here is our bracket. We've got our release, and this is our steering drive. And we'll put our propeller on down here once we get her mounted solid to the boat. So Jim, what do you say we go out back, take a look at your boat, uh, because we need to figure out how we're going to effectively mount the trolling motor to the boat and where we're gonna mount the battery charger and then where we're gonna put our three batteries to give us a 36 volt battery bank. So we've got a nice big expansive bow here uh, great platform to work with. We will have to do a little bit of investigation, see if it's solid enough to take the load and force of the trolling motor, both when it's in the stowed position and we're bouncing up over waves, we're running fast, we're trailering the boat. Um, and then also as the motor is moving the boat, is holding the boat, what happens if we're in really shallow water and the motor strikes an object uh, and the boat comes to a complete stop and all that force is transferred to this deck. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time making sure that that deck is strong enough so that, Jim, you don't have any surprises when you're out on the water. Uh, we may need to move, relocate this bow chalk uh, right here. Maybe we move it aft, maybe we move it forward. Uh, but the big thing is the bow ramp. Sure. So we've got a couple different options, things we can do. Um, one is, you know, maybe we do an open bow rail. We cut the bow rail off, we get a cap. Um, there's a little bit of trial and error. We might have to play to figure out how far back we have to go, but that's an option. Uh, the other option is on a boat like this where a bow rail might not be necessary. If you're cool with it, we just take the bow rail right off. I'm cool with just taking the bow rail off. Awesome. So let's see if it's through bolted or if it's tapped into the deck. And you can feel under here, so the cleat, it's nice, it's through bolted, um, but then I don't feel any hardware going through, so that's really nice because that's just as simple as just unscrewing. Should through. just be as simple as unscrewing. You know, we may run into some issues. The stainless steel and the aluminum are corroded together, um, but what we can do is then afterwards, we can either make nice little circles out of marine starboard, we can just put hardware in the place of the screws, uh, you know, or I could refer you to a fiberglass guy who might be able to match the non-skid. It's kind of up to you. But you can see the nicks in my fiberglass, so I'll go with the simplest here. Which simplest might be putting in new hardware, but we'll see what uh, we'll see what it is when we pull the deck, the bow rail off the deck. Um, you know, if we need to make little caps out of starboard, that's not hard at all. We'll be right here in the shop. So here's a Group 31 Deep Cycle Marine Battery. It's my favorite to run a trolling motor on a vessel of this size. We can go a little bit smaller if need be to do a Group 24, uh, but we definitely, whatever battery we choose, we wanna make sure it is a deep cycle battery. So different kinds of batteries. There is a normal starting battery that's designed to provide a very high load uh, for a very short time and then be recharged, like starting an engine. We have a very high draw from the starter motor, pulls out a lot of current all at once, then we have the alternator puts it back. Then we have deep cycle batteries. A deep cycle battery is meant to supply a moderate load 
all day long to take a very deep discharge. We can use a lot of the energy that's in this battery. Rough rule of thumb is we theoretically want to take it down to 50% of its charge for maximum life. Uh, but if it goes lower than that on an occasional basis, it's not going to hurt the battery. So we want to use deep cycle batteries. Each one of these batteries provides 12 volts. Since we're putting on a 36 volt trolling motor, we're going to need to do three of them and link them in what's called a series configuration. As you can see, this battery is not small. So we want to see where can we fit three of these guys. Let's take a look at this locker locker here. So without some major surgery, we're a little bit limited in terms of the height. Sarah, we have this other locker, I guess it's like a rope locker or something. Yeah, let's look in here, let's see what we've got. Uh, I don't think that's gonna, it's gonna be close. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't know if we're gonna have enough room with the terminals. Uh, you know, this might be an instance where, hey, maybe we decide we're not gonna use group 31s. Maybe we're gonna use something a little bit shorter because otherwise this could be a nice locker. We've got, well, it looks like we'd have to confirm an overboard discharge, uh, which is definitely something ABYC wants in a battery compartment. Um, you know, we might be able to put in some ventilation. That's another thing that we have to be concerned about as these batteries charge. Uh, they, they need to be able to off gas and ventilate. Uh, but as a result, you know, unless we were to cut out the floor, which on some boats, you got to get creative. And that might be the ultimate option here, Jim. We'll have to, you know, do a good survey of the boat and see, you know, if there's a better spot or if maybe we want to investigate trying to make this locker a little bit deeper because this could be a, a, a potential spot for the batteries. Let's see what we got underneath the helm seat in the console. So we've definitely got a lot of space. I see no reason that we couldn't fit three batteries, one, two, three right in here you know and that may be our best and easiest option uh let's get the fender out of here i'm gonna put in one battery just so we can see some scale you know i see we've got some drains we've already got a vent back there um you know this is an oil tank we don't want to do in the same compartment as a gas tank because of the flammable fumes but uh you know this is an oil tank for the two stroke and uh, I think this might be good because you've got a lot of space. It's also easy to accept, access the batteries. Uh, you know, we could mount the battery charger in here, uh, although I don't want to mount the battery charger above the batteries again because of, of the uh, potential for gas to be released. Uh, you know, we could, get, we could get the charger in here, like say off to one side, maybe add in another vent on that side of the console and uh, then we don't have that long of a run up to the bow to get uh, to get our heavy gauge cables. We've got the circuit breaker in here and uh, that make an, an, a nice install. You know, we are gonna have to do a little bit of investigation, figuring out how we can run the wires uh, from the console up to the bow, but uh, we'll take off those two side compartments and, and get to know the boat a little bit better. So Aaron, when I was choosing this uh, Minn Kota, this particular mm -hmm. Minn Kota, went with the um, with the 72 inch. Um, we took a little measurement outside just to make sure. It maybe could have gotten away with a 60, but how do you figure that out? It's 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 close. Your boat could have been could have worked with a 60, but what we did was we went out and we measured from the top of the deck down to the waterline. In this case, we were on the trailer, so we went down to the ground, right. and then we measured from the waterline to the ground, and we got you need about 38 inches uh, of space between, you have about 38 inches of freeboard from the top of the deck down to the water line. Uh, rough rule of thumb, we wanna add 12 inches to that to make sure our propeller is always submerged below the water, right? So now that 38 inches is now 50 inches. Okay. Uh, if the propeller comes out of the water, it will not move the boat. It will suck a lot of air. It'll scare the fish away. It'll kind of basically do the none of the purpose. things that right, we exactly. needed to do. Right. Um, then we need to add a little bit more space to that shaft because we have the control and we have the mount. 
right? So now we've taken that 50, we've added probably another good 10 inches. Mm, right. So we're, we're right there at 60 with your boat. So then that motor is gonna be all the way down. That gives us no room for expansion, no room to get that motor down a little lower on a, on a windier, rougher day. Um, no room for, for you to get a bigger boat and for us to move the motor to a bigger boat. The one downside, really the only downside aside from cost, to getting a longer shaft, uh, in your case of going to the 60 to the 72, is that when the motor is retracted, when it's not deployed, now you have this much longer, larger shaft to deal with, the head and the propeller out. You want to retract the propeller in so you know it's, it's not sticking out off your boat. And this rest of the motor is, is on your deck. So. But I guess, and that's another thing too, is that we're kind of a fishing machine here. So sure. It's good for us. Sure. But with the mounting plate, you know, if I was to say, you know, we're going to have a family day of doing something like that, I can... Absolutely. That's where the quick release is really nice because you can take the motor off the boat and you can then not have to Correct. worry about having this long shaft taking up valuable seating space on the boat. Go into thrust a little bit. We got 100, sure. 112 pounds of thrust. It's Great. 30, what is that, 34 volts? 36 volts. 36 volts. Um, you know, the one thing that I was thinking with that, the more power is good. If we hit any type of current, you know, some kind of rip going through a bridge, I'm gonna need a little bit more, but it's also more time spent out there fishing too. So kind of tell me a little bit what goes into choosing, you know, which thrust you'd want to get for that engine, for that Minn Kota. A lot of it goes into the weight of the boat uh, and the windage of the boat, because when we think about how we're going to be pushing the boat, pulling the boat, especially in a spot lock situation, uh, we need to be able to account for wind trying to push the boat out of the way, current trying to pull the boat off the spot. So the more thrust we have, it's like a it's a, like a larger engine on the back of the boat, right? Thrust is a measure of torque. So the more thrust we have, the more torque we have, the more we can counteract those forces that are trying to push us off the spot. Or if we're just trolling in a straight line, we're trying to buck a current, trying to buck wind, we have more power at our disposal. Nice thing about the motor is it's variable speed. So we don't always have to mm -hmm. be using 112 pounds of thrust, just like on your boat. You're not always up at full throttle using all 150 right. horsepower of the outboard on the back. It's variable so you can tailor the amount of thrust to the situation at hand. So it's always better in that case, if you can afford it, to, to have, have it more. Right, correct. Exactly. The, um, we got the Tarova, which is the manual deployment and the Altera, is the automatic, it's the, the remote. The sensor. remote deployment. Is, does that change the install at all? It really doesn't. Um, we do still need to make sure that if there are any uh, constraints, such as like a bow rail, sometimes what you can do is you can put the shaft out, then deploy uh, to get around a bow rail, whereas if it's an automatic deploy, we really need complete free space. Uh, but it does really in, increase the ability to single hand, you know, where, where you don't have to go up to the bow to deploy the motor. So in terms of that, the thrust and the shaft length, you know, that the Tarova comes in 45, 54, 60, and 72. And of course, we just found out that uh, Minn Kota is going to be launching an 87 uh, in shaft sometime in the fall of 2019. So if you move up beyond my 20 footer, if you're looking at a 28 or a 30, you know, that's something that has more freeboard. Sure, definitely something that is an option for you guys getting out offshore. You maybe want to uh, just spot lock on those uh, those tog grounds as well. Going over the install, we started out by putting our batteries into the console. We needed three Group 31 deep cycle batteries arranged in series to give us 36 volts. Then we mounted on a piece of starboard for a nice solid clean mounting surface, both the three bank 36 volt battery charger, so we can plug into 110 volt wall power, dockside power, shore power, top off our battery banks, replenish the energy that we used out on the water. Uh, and then also next to the battery charger, we have our 60 amp circuit breaker. Uh, we used heavy gauge cable. Uh, in this case, it was six gauge cable based on the length of the run, uh, calculated using the ABYC voltage drop tables, as well as uh, upsizing a little bit from the Minn Kota manual, again, to meet those ABYC requirements. 
Uh, we then have the wire running down into the bilge. Uh, there was no access, so we cut in a pie plate, an access hole, both in the console as well as up in the uh, forward anchor road compartment so that we could get our hands in there, fish the cable. The cable then exits uh, underneath these stainless steel clamshells packed with silicone, so we wanna make sure that no water gets in that bilge compartment. But again, because we've, we've now penetrated into that compartment, it's no longer a completely sealed compartment, we do have these two access plates so the compartment can be accessed on a regular basis just to check to see if there is any water intrusion and if so, that can be pumped out. Up in the bow then, we have our six gauge cables coming out. Those terminate in this really nice uh, Marinco quick disconnect that's rated up to 70 amps, so it's rated for more current than we're pulling, and that allows the trolling motor to be quickly disconnected or quickly removed, or if Jim wanted to put the trolling motor on another boat, he could easily get a brand new setup, a brand new female plug, wire that in, and then the motor could go back and forth. So that was one challenge that we had to overcome was how do we get those wires from the console up to the bow. And luckily on this angler, we were able to, to make our own access into that forward bilge uh, for the cables to run. Next challenge we had to solve was up on the bow, uh, the angler has a, a, a pretty good sized uh, angle, if you will, coming back from the rub rail. So we needed to extend the trolling motor over this angle and still give it a very solid mount so that it can take the whole force of the boat. What we ended up doing was taking three quarter inch starboard and custom cutting it on our CNC router to make a bow pulpit. And then that bow pulpit supports the trolling motor and is through bolted to the deck. Underneath the deck, we put another piece of starboard to distribute the load in addition to some fender washers so that we can make sure that this motor is not going anywhere. Uh, and whether we're trailering over the road at 70 miles an hour behind the truck or bouncing over wakes going out an inlet or spot locking on a windy day. Another thing we had to do after we put our bow pulpit on was remount our main bow cleat. In this case, we used the same exact holes through the deck. We just drilled those through our starboard and then used longer mounting hardware to reinstall the cleat. We're gonna take the bow chalk that we had to move for the trolling motor pulpit, move that aft and reinstall. And we fabricated these nice little caps to go over the bow rail attachment points that we're just gonna silicone down and put in some self-tapping screws to give that a nice finished and watertight look. For the spot lock function, for the autopilot function, the motor comes with an outboard heading sensor. Now, unlike the trolling motor, the heading sensor will only operate on 12 volts. So that needs to get tied into the vessel's 12 volt system, not the 36 volt dedicated propulsion bank for the trolling motor. In closing, I think we have a really nice addition to the boat that's gonna increase the fishability dramatically. I would plan on about a week of time to do the install, give or take. Actual time on the boat, maybe less, maybe more. I think a mechanically inclined person could definitely do a nice install, but I would always recommend consulting with a marine electrical professional because there are a lot of different aspects that need to be taken into account to get a successful install to have the most enjoyment out on the water. So, you know, we did some custom fabrication that might not be necessary on every single boat uh, because some boats you might just be able to bolt that trolling motor down and go but other boats present a little bit of a challenge and a marine professional can definitely best assess those challenges and make recommendations on how to solve them. Every boat's a little bit different, every boat's a little bit custom, and every challenge is solvable with a little bit of creativity. Inaugural trip of the year with the new Minn Kota Tarova. Got one tr uh, uh, trigger fish in the box. We're looking for sheep's head. And look at that, a little out of season, Mr. Toggy. The great thing about this Minn Kota Tarova, and one of the main reasons why I got it, is you can use that spot lock and anchor up right on the spot you want without getting all the 
problems with the anchor rope, and, uh, which is especially good when you're fishing by yourself, which I do a lot. We're gonna let him go. I'm so happy. It was a great success, and now I've got a lot to learn with the uh, trolling motor itself, with the controls, the spot lock, cruising along, but I'm looking forward to it. I hope this video was helpful for you in thinking about how you might want to do the same thing. My thanks to, of course, the folks of Minkota for making such a great product, and also Aaron Held, Octopus Yachts, and the crew there. Thank you so much. Catch him up, and uh, I'm going to go bait up again.